Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corkin here. I'm the host of this show. You know, check out some of our archives. We've got some great episodes there with CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of all kinds of companies. Check out Netflix, Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard. Lots of great ones there. I'm also the co-founder of Rise25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects with done-for-you podcasts and content marketing. And my guest here today, first of all, I want to give a shout out to Jason Swank of the Smart Agency Masterclass podcast and Digital Agency Elite. He's been a great mentor and friend and connected us with our guest here today. His name is Marty McDonald. He is the co-founder and CEO of Bad Rhino Inc. It's a full-service digital marketing agency based outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He has been in the digital marketing world since 2002 and has consulted with all kinds of small businesses and startups to help them succeed online today. Bad Rhino is a full service social media marketing and digital agency and services clients locally, nationally, and globally, especially in the world of beer and golf. So if anyone likes beer or golf, you definitely want to listen to this. They've also won top social media agency award in many different years by the research firm Clutch, which is really well respected. He's also the author of Great Beer is not enough. And of course, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25 Media, where you help B2B businesses get clients referrals and strategic partnerships with done for your podcasts and content marketing. Go to rise25media.com or email us at support at Rise 25 Media and learn all about it. All right, Marty, excited to have you here. I know we this was in the works for a long time. And uh, I want to start with your journey back in 2002. And you've got this story. Uh, you're a lot younger then. Uh, and you go <clears> into... <throat> Yeah, a lot more hair back then. And um, you, through ha happenstance, you end up going to a business networking meeting on a Saturday morning, and you're probably the youngest one in the room by at least 20 or 30 years. A bunch least. of older people in the room there, and they're all saying, I need a website. And you raise your hand and say, oh, I, I can do that, uh, even though it wasn't something you'd done a lot of then. But that's how you kind of got into the world of digital marketing. So tell us that story, how that ended up uh, coming to fruition and what entrepreneurial gumption you had to just like be like, hey, I'll do that. Yeah, no, first of all, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's been a while in the making, just bouncing back and forth with you and Jeremy and doing all that. So I appreciate that uh, wholeheartedly. I think it would be a fun conversation. Yeah, I love when I say it, like 2002 now, it's 20 years almost, right? So it's not quite because this was towards the end of 2002. And um, I had been messing around with a couple of different things online. And my brother had you know, introduced me to early forms of like paid advertising online and banner ads and these other things with affiliates. And I had walked in, I was a headhunter and I had saw this, I forget what I even saw. It was something that like a group of people and I was looking to network through these folks that are accountants, lawyers, they always have great contacts. And I was just going to this breakfast meeting. I was like, I can do this on a Saturday. I got nothing else to do. It was like 7.30 on a Saturday morning. And we show up and yeah, there's all of them were well in their late 60s, early 70s. And like I've said uh, before, when I tell this story, it was unfortunately, many of them are, are no longer with us. And when I think about it, 20 years of doing it, when I walked in, they were just talking about like, hey, we're trying to sell our business. We're trying to get out of here. My child, you know, their children, their grown children didn't want to take it over. Or if they did, they wanted to modernize it and they were all having the same issue. And the same issue was they had either a very, 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 very basic website that was built like when it was first websites were first there and they had to modernize it when it sounds crazy when I talk about it now, like a simple five page website, you know, with a place to, for an email newsletter. The only difference is back then. Back you had then. A, it wasn't a easy to put something like that together. Work. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't even know. I was I was putzing around with like landing pages and some basic stuff. And I just raised my hand and said, I could probably put that together and get you you guys something that you could work off of. And I did. I actually taught myself pretty much everything. I just wanted to come up with something that would work. And you know, it might have been Dreamweaver. I can't really even remember now. But I walked in, I showed them, and next thing you know, I had 
you know, 16 others were like, yeah, I will take one of those. And I got smart. I outsourced it because I was a recruiter. I knew a couple of web developers and we put it together and off we went. And after that, I had 16 clients on a side business and it eventually became our you know agency now, a bad rhino for the past 12 years. So, but it does seem weird going back and it's been a long time doing it and seeing a lot of different things. Yeah, I'm looking at your career trajectory here and you continued doing uh, recruiting for a lot of years after that. So at what point did you make the switch? Mm-hmm. Well, it was interesting because my whole goal was to build something on the side um, that would then help my income, no matter what. I was doing very well as a recruiter, headhunter, and I I was good at it, too. Um, When I walked away from it, a lot of people were shocked because I did enjoy it. You know, I, I liked helping people. I also liked getting in and designing organizations and helping startups. And I liked the interview process of working with somebody to find the right fit for them um, and vice versa for the client, finding that person that would work well. And I think my biggest claim to fame within the recruiting industry and working there was always just, you know, tell the truth. I mean, it sounds simple, but always make sure that you're finding the right fit. And sometimes it took a little bit longer, but my hires and the interviews were always good. Everything worked. And I was just trying to build something on the side. And I knew that no matter what you do in your career, things change, the economy changes, the world changes. And I just saw something that I was like, I I think this is the avenue in digital marketing that is really going to be something. And I had no idea, like social media wasn't even there yet. It was a very early form of social. And I just knew, you know, in the back of my mind that I wasn't going to be a recruiter all the time. Maybe I might do something slightly different. And I was building that on the side and doing some direct sales and some affiliate sales and a wide variety of other things. And right at the time when my business partner approached me, I thought it was the right time to kind of jump in and through all the bumps and bruises and roller coaster, here we are 12 years later. And, uh, you know, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but did you see the potential with digital marketing to build a bigger team like recruiters? And there are yeah. bigger re- recruiting agencies, but a lot of recruiters are kind of like cowboys. They're kind of out on their own. And you sure. kind of realize, you know, if I'm not working, if I'm on vacation or I'm sick or something, I'm not making money. Yeah. Was that part of the potential? I think I, it's 100 percent the where I was going and how I stumbled into it, John. Um, when. I started putting everything together way back when, in 2002, I started leveraging uh, LinkedIn and other forms of connecting with as many people as possible, as fast as possible, rather than picking up the phone and calling one person per, at a time. Like even mass email wasn't as cool slash effective is probably the right word as it was, you know, even a few years later where you could take a whole list and then just hit that whole list. The tools weren't all there. You'd have to do that almost manually. And even CRMs um, and employee or applicant tracking systems weren't built to do that like that. So when certain technologies came out, yeah, I started doing some of the marketing for the staffing firm I was working with and started getting that out digitally. And then also just leveraging LinkedIn to build that out. And you know, I saw a lot of success with it where people were connecting but they were connecting me with other people faster than, again, making that phone call, grabbing that cup of coffee or going out for drinks with somebody and saying, oh, yeah, well, you're not interested. Well, who else do you know? And then starting that process over. I saw that as an avenue to do it as fast as possible. Right. And I have to ask, um, have you found recruiting for your agency to be a, a superpower for you? Or is it something where, you know, like you had nothing to do with it because that was your old life? <laughs> No. Um, what's interesting is a great question um, because I also understand, and I would say anybody that's an agency owner that's watching this, hire a recruiter um, because what they can do for you, you may not use them all the time. You might be able to put in systems and, and things like that, but it's such a time suck as uh, an owner to go out and recruit your own people. That is one thing you should outsource to at least get a feel and a flow and a system if you've never done it before. Now, for myself and my business partner, we have both done it. So it's a both a uh, blessing and a curse. You know, it's a strength, but it's also a weakness. Do I spend time doing that versus there? But I will say this, like I've interviewed over 10,000 people in my life and hired over 1,500 or thereabouts. Um, and that skill set, you know, that's invaluable when right. I interview somebody. So that's right. really the big thing. Um, but outside of that, yeah, I, I 
outsource majority of that and then just do the final interviews, but it does help tremendously. Right. It's an interesting <clears throat> point that you make. I say this oftentimes that, you know, your greatest strength eventually becomes your biggest bottleneck yeah. because if you keep it to yourself, you hold it in, then you're <laughs> this going to be the last thing that you give up because you know that yeah. you can do it really well. Like, you know, my background is as a writer, I worked in the Clinton white house as a writer, speech writer, wrote for Forbes. I did a lot of writing. And now we have a whole team of writers and I don't even touch the writing, but it took mm -hmm. a long time for me to get comfortable with that, right? To, to, to let that go and, and to yeah. know that others are going to be able to do a better job than you are, you know, and, and yeah. something that you, you can, you have to be able to oversee, but not, not, you know, um, a, you know, put your, your own subjective opinions into everything. It's called growth, right? And then sometimes <laughs> it's painful to let go of that stuff. And I find the same thing, like even strategy for our marketing clients. Like I love to talk strategy all day, every day, but I also know that there's other things I need to be doing to make everything move. So I can't just be talking to clients every day. And that part of it is like, as you start to grow, it's like, okay, let's, you have to let that go too. So it's like understanding where your strengths are. They may not be uh, strengths that you need in that moment. They just need to be something that you're sharpening that you'll need somewhere else down the road. But you have to understand where your time spent and what's going to you know, be most valuable for your organization. Right. Now, um, I teased it in the intro, but you work with golf companies <laughs> and you work yeah. with beer companies, uh, yes. both two things that are wildly pop popular with people who like beer and like golf. Exactly. And um, we were talking beforehand about how you kind of made a conscious decision and you ended up, this is a really interesting way of going into mm -hmm. a niche. He said, we're going to start a brand and we're going to build it up ourselves. We're going to test those yes. systems ourselves. And then we're going to be able to deploy it for clients. So talk a little bit about how you did that in the golf niche in particular, and then we'll talk about beer. <clears throat> yeah. So doing it for so long, um, it's just like anything else. Like I, I still love it, but at the same time you get, um, you know, bored of doing the, the, the boring clients, which, it's just almost paint by numbers at certain times, like not knocking any of our clients just or discounting anything that we do. But occasionally you get in this rut where like, okay, he needs a little more ad spend. We need to create a new piece of content. We need to hit this email list and let's see what it, it, it goes. And it's like, oh, okay, that's working again. Okay, then tweak this, tweak that. And it gets, you know, it can get monotonous at times, right? Um, I always say digital marketing isn't easy, but it's a lot of tasks that add up. And if you're doing them right, they'll produce a return for you, but you have to look at it constantly. And that's normally what Bad Rhino is doing for their clients. And started off with a couple of conversations around craft beer it was one of the first ones uh, that we actually got, you know, clients for when we had dabbled in the golf world and how we went about it was how can you go into an industry that you might have a passion for in some way, shape or form? Um, and for golf, that's something that if I could go golf right now, I'd go play golf. If I could go golf right after that, I would probably go play golf. If I could then go practice, I would then practice. And then tomorrow I would get up and then I would what play again. What you're saying is you like golfing a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like, I, that's where I feel just relaxed. I like to hang out there. I like to talk about it. I like to play it and the challenge of the game. So it's like, how do you combine that without, um, you know, screwing up your love of the game. Cause once you get in the industry is a lot of different things. So putting together pieces that were fun and that we could prove out that we could take all the digital marketing knowledge and dumping into the golf industry and then show them something. And we created uh, golfing fanatics and we also created golf cheapskate. Well, we purchased that. And then we just tested things on there. You know, we built lists off of there. We have a hundred thousand plus on each one. Um, and emails. And we then would say, okay, well, you can take this and leverage this list. We can test things off of it. That's not your brand. And that was our intro into it. And then we wind up walking, working with uh, golf courses, uh, mostly on a consultative basis on, on courses that I wound up working with PGA section of, uh, of Philadelphia. So that was fun. We still do work with them and brought in the speak and, and talk to people, Walked, worked with a couple of golf teaching professionals, not on the PGA. So like and they then, had indiv individual businesses, teaching businesses. Or, yeah, yeah. Or they work at a country club and they're looking okay. at how they communicate with students, how do they bring new people to the game. And then over time, you know, it's just evolved where it's like a rotating list of people, some existing uh, people, and then mostly referrals that have come in. And it's been great because from there, you're just talking about things that you love. 
And I try and tell that to my staff. I ask everybody that we hire, whether they're an intern or full-time, I'm like, if you could pick the types of clients that you could have, what would you do? And we have one um, young, young guy right now that he's, he loves fishing and he passed all the tests. And now we're saying, I right, well, let's create a fishing brand and let's see what we can go. And we've already done things in the outdoors. So it was just a combo. But what I found was getting burned out on doing digital marketing for doing it for so long, I had to combine something that I really enjoyed, which was golf. And then I'll get to the beer in a minute. But the golf thing was like, I could just talk about golf, right? It's easy. Like uh, we have one client and somebody that we work with through the other brands, uh, squares, and they're all over the place. And I'm going down to Orlando to meet with them at the PGA show and go to their one party with all their partners. And it's just fun and easy to talk to. Like I wind up talking to Bob for hours sometimes to my detriment, but I get a lot of things out. And I say that and I go, Ooh, wait a minute. That'd be good for X, Y, Z client. Or you know what? So-and-so could use that. So it comes out naturally because I've been doing it so long. Then the second part is you talk about something you're passionate about and then golf or beer turned into the same thing. It was just a little bit in reverse. I was actually speaking. We've done, uh, when we started Bad Rhino, we did a lot and we still do in restaurants and um, food service and uh, specific foods. Like we have an Italian food, brand that's just Italian food. And they do a lot of great stuff in Philadelphia called Toludo's and doing that work. Like Rich and I decided my, our, you know, my other partner here at Bad Rhino decided we should probably branch into some other restaurants. So I joined a um, restaurant networking group and I'm up front and getting, I was asked to speak and then I'm getting drilled by somebody in the back. And it turns out to be one of the founders of one of the largest breweries that's one of the larger breweries in the country and they happen to be in our backyard. And then a week and a half later, I'm sitting in the brewery and then I signed, you know, I signed a contract there. <laughs> and next thing you know, we had a brewery client. It really wasn't going after it. it was interested, but wasn't going after craft beer specifically. And then after that experience for 18 months, I wrote a book about it, um, which is great beers, not enough, which is a couple of years old. It's going to be updated probably later this year, but with um, everything that's been going on the past couple of years, you know, craft, brewing took a hit and everybody that owned a restaurant took a hit. Um, but they turned into the book, it turned into the podcast, and then it turned into us working with, uh, I've been down in North Carolina and Florida and a handful of other places talking to the beer guilds about helping these startups in the craft brewery world, just get started, but not forget about the marketing. It's easy to post a picture of beer and people having fun, but do you have any thought behind it? And we got involved with that. And we did it the reverse. Instead of creating the, the brands that we did to get into the golf industry, from our beer knowledge, we created the Hop Nation um, that does the same thing. And we built lists and a following there. We took a pause during um, the whole pandemic just because it didn't make sense to really have a lot of fun with uh, craft beer and promote it that way because that's how it was. We always wanted to have fun with it. It was tough when so many people were hurting financially because they, they couldn't have their tap rooms open and things like that. So that's how we got into craft beer and golf. And um, I want to ask you about that's interesting because you, you have in a sense built your own assets or your own almost mm -hmm. like separate businesses. They Sometimes are. businesses struggle with what amount of focus to put on that. Yeah. Um, you know, if they put too much energy into it and, and sometimes it, it becomes a, a revenue source, a profit source. How have you determined that? How much energy you should put into these other kind of side projects or side initiatives? Yeah, great question. And it definitely has reared its head that way a couple of times. But what we've done is <clears throat> we know what the difference is. So we use golf um, and beer, that one as well. We've used it as training. So we've taken that and say, all right, for our social media managers, our digital marketers that are running paid campaigns, we're saying, go ahead and run with this. You have freedom to do whatever, but here's, here's the parameters. So we could do that and they could learn and not feel the pressure of making a mistake in front of a, a quote unquote real client, right? But they would also learn the industry. So then when we get a golf client, it was like, hey, you know, so-and-so has already done so much great stuff with the, the golf brands that we have. Go ahead and do that. So we had to rethink some things because of the exact same thing that you just asked me is like, where does that turn out and where's the attention going, right? Where do you have things? They were never there to be full-blown 
in the terms of Bad Rhino anyway, full-blown revenue generators. What they were there to do was to use as a lead gen and a tool that we could tell the, the client, like, hey, we can also run everything through this giant email list and a giant Facebook group that we already run paid traffic to. So we can give away your products and or talk about your products. And we can test it anonymously, like, hey, XYZ just gave us two pairs of shoes. We're going to give them away, but you have to give us some feedback on it. And they loved it because it was a quick testimonial of what we could do. Also, they could also generate sales. And at the same time, we can show them the power of a highly fine-tuned golf community uh, on social media and an email list. A brilliant idea. More companies ought to do something like that just to create those yeah. types of resources. And I'm sure it's super attractive for the clients. They're like, wow, 100,000 person email list. That sounds amazing. Yeah. And we do a lot of it um, for right, wrong, or indifferent. We do it for free um, at first. And there's some parameters. I mean, it's not entirely free, but it's pretty close to free. Like, hey, if you want to give us some stuff, if it's a clothing retailer or equipment manufacturer, it'd be like, hey, you know, if you want to send over some things, we'll help you out and then we'll give them away. But we also want to be able to, you know, make sure that it's real. And then there's like a flat fee sometimes uh, based on what they want to do. And it's worked out wonderfully. Yeah. I, mean, I yeah. can't complain. Cool idea. Um, I want to ask you about working with restaurants and uh, craft breweries, especially during the pandemic. Um, we yeah. have a, a series on one of our podcasts um, focusing on restaurant tours <laughs> which in many yeah. cases are just kind of the bread and butter of this economy and just been hit so hard and had to pivot. You know, the analogy I've used is kind of like a boxer up against the ropes, you know, just getting hit back and forth. Good way to what, put it. Yeah. What has it been like for you with these clients? What have you seen working? What type of pivots have they had to do? What role has digital marketing played for these businesses over the last two years? So day one, I was actually like right before the whole world shut down, I was flying back from San Diego with a contract to work with uh, brewers that were going into casinos. And um, I was excited because it was a lot of work to get to that point. And it was a very lucrative contract. Oh, so I'm already geez. thinking like as I'm fly, as I'm landing, I'm like, OK, we got to do this. We got to do this. We're going to have to meet in two weeks. I'm probably going to fly back out here in a month. And then the whole world stopped, but it was impactful for just that. I mean, that kind of bummed me out because that was a, a lot of work. A yeah. Cumulative of about five years worth of work went into getting that. And that just yeah. went up just like that. But so is and, life. And right? San Diego has an amazing beer scene. I know Stone, yeah. so many great breweries down there. So many great life. ones there. Yeah. Yeah. Tons. And um, it it was interesting. And then, and then it quickly shifted to, okay, well, we also have quite a few restaurants and breweries that we work with for years. So the ones that we have been around for quite a while, easy conversations, like they're like, look, here's what we need to do. What do you suggest? And that was easy conversation. Some of the newer ones that were, were about to take it on the chin, probably worse than, uh, Worse than any other industry, um, that was just immediately like, hey, we don't even know what we're going to do. We just got to stop everything right now because they they had no idea. And it would lasted for probably about close to almost three full months, at least in our area and the areas that we were working in where they had no outlet like whatsoever to produce revenue. But how digital marketing actually then started working through there was got a lot more work than we ever anticipated in there where they had to refit their websites. They had to do online ordering, prepare for take, you know, takeout and other things and became a lot of project work, <clears throat> which we did um, to help them out. And some of them, we, you know, got paid on some of it. We were just adjusting things that they had paid for before just to help them out. But yeah, I mean, it was brutal for everybody in that industry. Uh, not only the owners, but the workers, the staff, I mean, just, the vendors, like I always was taught, like, if you see restaurants doing well, you know, the economy is doing well. And I always kept that in the back of my mind in all of my professional career. And the few times I used to see like restaurants, like, hmm, it's interesting. Like the last couple of weeks I walked by here, I drove by here. I don't see as many cars. And then, you know, the first time I remember noticing that then was the financial crash. And it was weird because it is true, like that industry ties a lot of things together from people that have side jobs, the people that have their main jobs as their great bartenders and servers and things like that, 
then you have the vendors that supply, you have the farmers and other people that supply the restaurants locally, as well as some of the bigger ones. And you have a lot of trickle down effect with that that affects the economy here in the US for sure. And it was a little scary, but we had to, we got through it with a lot of them and digital marketing played a huge role. And now that we're, you know, knock on wood kind of coming out of it in the past few months, we've seen a big uptick in inquiries about, you know, what they want to do next, um, not only from current clients, but potential new ones. So it's a wild ride. And I hope uh, anybody that has a restaurant out there that if you can hang on, I think better days are ahead. But I mean, kudos to you if you've stayed in business this while, this while, while all this was going on. Absolutely. I mean, so many courageous restaurateurs, restaurant you know, <clears throat> owners, operators, it, it's amazing what they've been through. Um, I yeah. want to ask about uh, one thing. You are kind of known by many in the agency world as an expert in client experience. And um, yeah. I watched the training that you did on this. Um, it involved rhino pins that played mm -hmm. a role in uh, in nurturing clients and former clients as well. So talk a little bit oh. about some of the things that you've learned over the last 20 years of managing clients and giving them a great experience. You know, it's funny and I appreciate bringing this up. And also, I really appreciate bringing it up because I actually have to order those pins. Um, it's been <laughs> on my to-do list. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, I gave the last one away. Global um, supply chain. Hopefully the, uh, the, the rhino yeah, pins are not stuck on a ship same. off of California here. Who knows? Um, you know, it's interesting, John, it's like what we always try and do, and Rich is, is way better at, at it than I am, is just remembering things, right? So we just always start off as just thank you cards. Like somebody gives you a call. Um, I'm not at my desk uh, in my office. I have a stack of them. And it's just like, here's the card, you know, and I tell all our people, like, if you ever get stuck and you're not sure what to do or fix a situation, you can't go wrong by dropping that in the mail. You'd be surprised. Um, so I started there like way back when, um, even when I was recruiting, like I still have them when I got people jobs or they got new jobs or I took an interview with somebody and they sent me a handwritten thank you note. I've kept all of them quite honestly, because not too many people do it. And it's a memorable thing that you get that in the mail and it's just like, oh, thank you for taking the time. And some of them, I got jobs, some of them I didn't. Um, and over the years I kept those and I took that same philosophy when we started Bad Rhino. I was like, take the five minutes at the end of each day. And it's not even too fancy. It's like, you know, hey, John, thanks for having me on your show. Really appreciate it. If you never need anything, let me know. Throw a business card in there, put a stamp on it, fire it out. Right. And, you know, it takes a few minutes and it's just a simple thing. And a lot of people have like, they'll send me, I love when I get emails. Hey, thank you for the thank you card. <laughs> right? It's just the touch point, right? Right. And so when we started Bad Rhino, we've done a variety of things over the years. And in that presentation, one of the things that we've done is we've adopted rhinos. Um, so you get like your own rhino and it's just a cool little thing that you get an update. And then like so when they leave. a charity or nonprofit yeah. that helps for rhinos, which by the way, is not how you came up with the name. It wasn't like a no. great passion for rhinos. You just like the <laughs> name. Nothing to do. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah, we just, um, Rich came up with a cool name and we ran with it. And, um, but yeah, so we give away the pins and then we try and do something around the rhinos there. But it's hard, you know, it's like, hey, you adopted a rhino, right? And we'll keep your rhino um, going. So it's not like a client leaves, like you're going to get rid of the rhino. So like if you have XYZ client and they have a rhino, I'm not going to stop supporting that rhino. Right? <laughs> like that would be cruel. Yeah. Uh, so we keep it. And then, you know, for X clients, um, as long as they're still in business, they get an email, you know, once or twice a year that just says, hey, you still have your rhino. Nobody unsubscribes from that list. And mm. it's awesome. You know, you just build that up. Did, and did, you do I'm, that. I'm curious. So these former clients, do they email you back? Or do they say, thanks for the donation? Like, no. no it, we, oh, I, I've had a few. I shouldn't say that. I've had a few saying, oh, hey, great to hear from you guys. Uh, appreciate it. You know, hope all is well. Happy New Year, whatever. Yeah. Um, but we've never really had... Uh, you know, anybody like yell or scream, like who's going to do that? Like stop yeah. giving that money to my <laughs> yeah, stop, Frankie stop the Rhino saving. in Africa. Exactly. And that's it. And and it's interesting. It's also sparked a handful of conversations and referrals too. And, you know, it's just, I think sometimes everybody takes it a little too serious. Like you lose a client and it's just like, oh, well that person, you know, I hate that person. I don't like that person. I don't want to be reminded. And I, Hey, I, 100% am like that too, right? At certain times. 
But at the same time, like, ah, you know, it's business. They had a change. They weren't happy, you know, whatever it is, as long as we can stand on what we did and we always have, and we've never had knock on wood issues with that in 12 years. And we can always report back saying, Hey, you know, I, I understand that you needed a change, but we also going to keep the rhinos and, you know, it's a nice little thing that, to remind them that we were there and we helped them on their journey in some way, shape or form. That's cool. And then, you know, have you seen others do something similar? Have you, you advised others who have done something similar like that, have like a little thing? Yeah, I'm big on um, really nice corporate gifts. Um, and I've talked to a lot of people that were like, well, I'm not sure if I want to do, you know, the rhino thing, kind of save the world, doesn't fit with our brand. But I always say, you know, if you're going to send me something, and we've been doing business for a while and I'm just making this up and let's say I pay you a thousand dollars a month or even 500 a month. That's take 500. So six grand a year. And you send me a $5 notebook, right? Like, come on. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Dude, I, I, I hate that shit. Like, excuse yeah. me, but I, I, I with their I, logo I, on it. Yeah. No, we're, we're big their fans logo, of, right? I'm sure, you know, John Rulin is kind of the thought leader in this area around, yeah. you know, gifting and yeah. So, I get it like as a promotional thing, right? But especially at the end of the year when everybody sends you something, right? And you get like a flimsy notebook or something goofy and you're just like, come on, man, like just step it up a touch. It doesn't have to be a lot. Um, so what we do, and I've advised people and I know that things that work is like, hey, John, who's your, you know, do you follow sports? Do I? Yeah. Yeah, a bit. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a favorite sport or a favorite like professional yeah, so We'll say team? San Francisco Giants, sure. Yeah. So like, I just take a note of that and maybe, you know, it's before baseball season. Um, I'm not going to get you tickets or anything. I'm not going to make you commit to something. What I'm going to do is just find something that's unique. Like, so maybe we're talking on a second phone call and you go, yeah, you know what? I really didn't like uh, Barry Bonds, but I loved uh, Mr. Catcher. Um, Buster Posey. Buster Posey. Yeah. yeah. And by the butcher. way, that's spot on. I feel exactly right? that way. <laughs> so, and then I just go and I look for something that Posey signed or something like that. And, you know, it doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. No. Um, but, you know, I send that over to you and something small. And it's something that I always try and consider, like, if it doesn't fit the motif of your office or you need to get rid of it, I always make it a gift that somebody could like either re-gift or resell because nobody likes stuff that's sitting around that you're just like, huh, I'm never going to use that, but I don't want to throw it away because it's a nice hundred dollar gift and it doesn't really, or it doesn't really fit or my girlfriend or wife's not going to like it or whatever. And you just put a little bit more thought into it. And what I found is like the response is like overwhelmingly awesome. Like a uh, friend of mine, Tony, I didn't even think we did business together. We actually just traded podcasts and some other things. And he kept mentioning how good he was a Raiders fan. And I got him a signed Raiders little mini helmet, you know, and I'm like, cool. here you go. And he was like, dude, this is awesome. And he's like, nobody ever pays attention when I'm talking about these things. <laughs> and it, that type of stuff to me is like, cool. And then I've done like this past year is like, I had really nice gifts uh, made. I'm actually waiting for them still. I actually sent out a couple of notes saying, Hey, I have something for you. I just don't know where it's at yet, but it's had them like custom created with their own logo and their own brand. And just something I know that they'll at least use or look at and be like, you know what, that was just a nice thought. And that's the only thing is just taking that one extra step rather than just ordering like a cheesy notebook and putting it out there. And it's just yeah. like with your own logo on it. Now I do send really high end stuff with my own logo out to people that I know will want it. Um, I don't send it out to all my clients because I think that's kind of odd, but I'll send it out and I just get like really nice stuff. If I'm going to do a t-shirt, it's going to be a very high quality t-shirt, very high quality sweatshirt or hat or things like that. But it's just a connection point. And I think that's important to do. And you should have a process for anybody on board. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, this has been great, Marty. I, I want to wrap things up with the last question that I always ask. So I'm a big fan of gratitude. And if you look sure. around at your peers and contemporaries, however you want to define that, you know, who out there do you respect, do you admire, who would you want to acknowledge publicly and just thank them for being there for you or helping you along the way? Sure. I know. I mean, I know in the, the notes and everything, we're just leaving out friends and family. So I'm not forgetting about you. No, they're great. We love this. them. Yeah. <laughs> friends, family and all that. That's all good stuff. Right. Um, but there's a couple of people. Yeah. So the first one, I mean, um, who I met um, and we've doing, done a lot of projects work together eight years, kind of like my conscience and uh we joke around a lot. We play a lot of golf together and um, we share agency war stories and 
you know, we'll, we'll start off in the morning and play around a golf. And by lunch, we're, we're kind of relaxed and talking about new things. And we just use it as a bitch session. It's Ben Ladani, a creative MMS, and uh, he's in Philadelphia. And he's always been great. He'll text me, call me, like different times a year. And um, it's always been a lot of fun. Uh, another one real quick, Justin Christensen, who I've been friends with for years. And uh, another person that is great from that standpoint, A, does great work with conversion fanatics, super smart in the e-com world. One of the smartest guys I've worked with for sure. Um, and continue that and value that relationship tremendously. Not only the work that we trade, but then just bouncing ideas and talking to. Uh, next one, Joey Gilkey, um, who's been a guy that I've gotten to know over the past three years. And we do the same thing. We have a weekly standing call and he's always there to listen to me and uh vice versa and it's great because you know he's he's younger than i am which i you know as i get up there it feels like everybody's younger in this game but i think i provide value to him and vice versa and it's always nice to hear that where he has he is on his journey and finally i and garlic um and uh, you know the video work that he's done and, and stuff for us has been invaluable over the past few years. And we've been partnering on a handful of things and um, working on those, but he's done an amazing job of putting tons of things out there for me and helping me guide me through that process where I know a ton about marketing. But I don't know much about like where video should be and how it should be shot. And he's helped me out a ton over the past few years, not only in golf, but also in our agency and some of our clients as well. So those are the ones that uh, just right there in the inner circle. Um, there's many, many more. And there's a lot of people I'm forgetting. And I'm sure I'll hear about it when we publish this podcast. I know. Why didn't you mention me? <laughs> Why yeah. didn't you mention me? I don't know, man. I'm, I don't get nervous <laughs> on these things, but I don't have a list. And we got a time limit here. We don't want to do it all day. You know, it's so funny. We've never spoken before, but we kind of overlapped in different communities and things like that. And I know sure. all four of those. And Ben, I was oh, just cool. talking about him this morning. Ian Garlic is a great friend and a client of ours. And he's done case stories for us on our website yeah, yeah. that are phenomenal. I recommend him all the time. Joey, I've had on the podcast. Justin, I think I have his book over here on my bookshelf here. Small world. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you haven't had Justin on, you should have Justin on. Justin is by far one of the smartest dudes in this that I've ever met and he can break things down, but he also does it in a way that not only can educate you, but gets results and he's just really good at it. That's great. Yeah, no, I have an interview. I'm so I appreciate that recommendation. I'll definitely reach out. Yeah. Marty, where can people go to uh, learn about you? It's not badrhino.com, which is nope. a clothing, clothing brand. Store. Bad Rhino <laughs> Inc. A, I believe it is. That is badrhinoinc.com. Um, put that in. Um, we have a brand new website coming out here in the next 10, 12 days, but you can still go to our old site. It's got plenty of information. I offer this on every podcast. If you're listening to this um, and you're, hey, I want to talk to Marty about something. I'm not going to guarantee it's going to be me that's responding to you immediately, but somebody will get back to you really quickly. Just send an email to info at badrhinoinc.com. Mention this podcast in the subject line and somebody will get back to you one way or the other with a question, answer, set up appointment, whatever it is. Uh, but you can find us there. If you search Bad Rhino Inc., uh, you'll find us all over the place. Bad Rhino Digital Marketing is actually a better keyword and uh, you know social media, et cetera. Excellent. Marty, thanks so much. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Great time. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast. <laughs>